call to order the Parks and Recreation meeting for April 26th. If you will all rise and join me in the pledge. Ready, pledge. Roll call, please. Chair Longstreet? Here. Vice Chair Clark? Here. Commissioner Cavazos? Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton? Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen? Here. Commissioner Armbruster? Here. Okay, do we have any changes to the agenda? Chair Longstreet and Commission, we would like to take the um, budget item, which is item number six, in advance of the integrated pest management item, if that's okay. That will be great. Thank you. Um, do we have any written communications? Just two items, and we've all received them. Um, public comment, any member of the public may address the Commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. The total amount of time for public comment will be 15 minutes. We've not received any speaker slips and I see no one in the audience. So we will close public comment. Youth Council Report. Hi, Welcome. Madam Chair and members of the um, Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, my name is Jensen Steady. As you may know, I've been here a few times. Um, so first off, we are still working on our ALMA project, which is the um, Adolescent Leaders Modeling Acceptance, which is um, helping out undocumented students and like the position that they are currently in, in our current um, political climate. Secondly, we are um, still recruiting. Applications are due on May 1st for um, Anyone that wants to join the Youth Council, um, we're all working hard to make sure people from our schools apply, um, and especially especially private schools, which we need people from. So if you know anyone or any teenagers that would be interested, um, please send them our way. Um, third, we are currently doing a Youth to City project where um, members from the Youth Council, such as myself, are like meeting with members from the City Council. Um, to get to know each other and like help each other on possible projects um, so we can learn a little bit more about like the inner workings here. Um, I met with um, Councilman Dominguez uh, two weeks ago. We were talking about projects he was doing, um, invited him to a, um, a, like a meeting that we we're going to have, stuff like that. So we've been working on that. Um, and then two dates, we are going to be having our youth leadership banquet, which is going to be May 22nd. And we're going to, be going to be having an end of the year dinner um, for the Youth Council, which will be June 5th. And you all will be invited to that. I think you'll be getting those shortly. Um, and lastly, also, I did apply to be the um, Parks and Rec um, like youth member. I think that's what it's called from yes. the Youth Council. Um, and I know my application, I submitted it. And I'm not quite sure what the status of that is because I haven't gotten a report back on that, but I know it's been a couple weeks, and I just don't know exactly what to do next. So, if you have any insight on that? Let, Ms. Zachary, does that go through the same process as um, a regular appointment to the commission? Chair Longstreet and commissioners, we've actually been working with the city clerk's office to verify the process, and we'll look into where your application went. But it should have gone to the city clerk's office. Okay. But Great. thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we'd love to have you yeah, okay. serve with us. Awesome. Thank okay. you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jensen? Yeah. No? Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. We did receive a public comment request. Um, we have already closed it, but come on up, Mr. Locke, um, and we'll give you your two minutes. You are always a respectful public commenter, and we appreciate well, that. I'll, so. I'll do my best. I just Thank thought, you. My name is Kenneth Salak. I just happen to be in the neighborhood. I just thought I'd stop by. I'm doing. I'm still working on my uh, tennis. Uh, doing some videos and tweeting on Twitter. I call it the Tennessance method. It's a teaching method. Uh, the Renaissance of tennis. And uh, I worked. Uh, did some tweets this morning talking about the whole idea of um, a learning disability. 
And it turns out that I'm the first tennis teacher to teach tennis as a mind-body exercise, holistic health practice where you develop both arms. And it turns out that tennis hasn't had a teacher to actually provide students with an education in relation to increasing their intelligence and then increasing their coordination. So I don't know if I, let, me, let me repeat myself here. The, the students have been kind of, as a result, of um, suffered a learning disability, again, based on the fact that they haven't had a teacher. And then also, like, uh, the, the teachers, I'm sorry to say, are, are, uh, have a teaching disability. And the idea that uh, the, a teaching disability, which is, means a teacher doesn't kind of have the ability to teach, and a learning disability are relatively the same thing. And then the whole basis of uh, sustainability, uh, I had a sign on my bike uh, over the Earth Day saying that uh, stupid is not sustainable. And it, uh, the idea is what we need to sustain is uh, education. We have to sustain teachers, make it possible. And the problems with sports, uh, they're causing, they're, they're, the players are making all the money and they're making a lot of money, and it's 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 a whole thing is kind of failing our, our educational system, and um, I'm hoping to be able to hope we can all kind of change that because right now the again the education is taking a back seat uh, to all this. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. You too. Okay, that bring we will close public comment. Um, brings us to commissioner committee assignment reports. Um, why don't we start with? Commissioner Lester Buxton. The key show I attended the neighborhood advisory committee and hold a presentation on the city's food distribution services. Also, the commissioner gave a breath to Parks and Rec staff, the committee gave a voice on what project they wanted to see done in neighborhood services in the coming year. Thank you. Commissioner Cavazos. Talk. <laughs> Get an allergy attack. Uh, I attended the uh, Park Foundation board meeting. Uh, we're still working on fundraising options for 2017. So if you're ready to donate, Park is a great, great organization. That's my plug. Uh, I also attended the special meeting for Parks and Rec Commission last week to go over the budget, review that. It was a great presentation. And we'll see more about that in about, I don't know what, five minutes? Ten? So 25. <laughs> I was unfortunately unable to attend the Integrated Pest Management Committee uh, on which I'm serving as a liaison, but we have a nice report in our packet that we'll go over later. On April 6, I attended the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting where we visited every tree on our agenda and discussed at great length the applications we're going to talk about later. On April 19th, I also attended the Park Foundation Board meeting. Uh, couple items we covered, we voted to disperse funds from the Douglas Family Preserve Endowment Account to the Parks and Rec Department Miscellaneous Grants Fund for repair and restoration of trails and nat native hab habitats at the DFP. Uh, we also dispensed funds uh, to the department for the Russ Morrison Junior Golf Program, the Public Garden Advertisement, and the 90th Birthday Party. On April 19th, I attended the budget workshop session with the other commissioners, and I agree it was a very worthwhile presentation. It helped us understand the material, so thank you. Uh, the Arts and Crafts uh, meeting was on April 11th, and unfortunately, I was not able to attend. I was out of town for work, um, but I know that they are still working on the online sign-up system for the slots, and they were going to do a live demo that got a little bit delayed, but that's coming. Um, they always have a very full agenda, lots of things going on. <laughs> And then the um, Creeks uh, committee meeting is actually got postponed till tonight at 530. So I don't think I'm really going to be able to attend that one because I'm here. But I will report back later on those minutes. Um, and I did also attend the um, budget meeting. That was very, very informative. Um, and I'm excited to talk about it more today. Thank you. Ms. Aaron Brester. 
Um, I attended the golf committee meeting yesterday um, where we went over the golf section of the budget that we're going to discuss tonight um, in depth. So that was very informative. And then I also attended the um, budget meeting that we did last week as well for the Parks Commission. So lots of budget information. So good. Thank you. Um, well, I missed the NAC meeting, but I attended the chair and vice chairs of commissions meeting out at the airport. It's a semi-annual meeting where all the different commissions get together. And we discussed, um, well, we received a presentation on some of the new flights in and out of the airport and ha the happenings out there and then discussed issues in the city of relevance, um, such as the budget, things happening downtown and um, some things in parks and rec. So it was a, a very good meeting. All right, so with that closed, we go to commission and staff communications, none, and ceremonial items. We don't have any this month, do we? No. And um, can, um, consent items, we're at. Uh, Chair Longstreet, yes. we didn't have any staff that were recognized for their service this month, um, oh. so that's why we don't have it listed as a specific item for this okay. agenda. Are there any questions on the summary of council actions? And we will move on to consent items, the minutes. We have the minutes of March 22nd that you received in your packet. Any changes or additions? Hamo. I'll make a motion to waive the reading and approve the minutes of the regular meeting of March 22nd, 2017. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. And that brings us to our Street Tree Advisory Committee items. Mr. Downey. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, uh, the first item on the agenda is 434 Paseo del Descanso. There is a liquid amber that is located in such a way that it is considered a street tree. Um, the, uh, the tree is located directly adjacent to the driveway and on the other side of the tree are the water line and the uh, sewer line within just a couple of feet of the tree. Uh, the tree is damaging the uh, apron, and uh, the concerns are that you know it'll continue to cause damage to the driveway, the underground utilities, and it shades the uh, pine tree directly behind it that they want to preserve. Um, the committee evaluated the request and uh, and determined that the pine tree would receive some benefit from the removal of this tree. The applicant is proposing to plant in within the setback a, a weeping acacia, um, and the committee uh, therefore recommends that the commission approve this removal. Okay. Any questions of staff? Comments? A motion? <laughs> um, I'll make a motion that the commission Commissionally approves the removal of the liquid amber at 434 Paseo del Desconso on the condition that a weeping acacia should be planted as proposed on the application. Second. I'll second that. Okay, so uh, any discussion of the motion? Seeing no one, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, that passes unanimously. Item B1, 333. Chair, Chair Long Street and Commissioners, uh, this uh, location is 333 Vista de la Cumbre. Uh, there's two uh, golden rain trees at this property. One is smaller than the other. Uh, the one uh, on the right in this photo is the smaller one. It's on the edge of the driveway uh, closest to the neighbor. Uh, its condition is such that it is declining and has some decay at the base. Um, the 
other larger tree in the front yard uh, they, they are proposing to remove as well due to two reasons primarily. Uh, it is in a uh, declining state um, and it is on top of both gas and water lines that supply the property. Um, their proposal is to replace uh, these two trees with a uh, California pepper tree and, and, let me check my notes, I'm sorry, uh, and a jacaranda. Um, they plan to place them in better locations farther away from the, the problem areas. Um, they are not uh, proposing removal of any of the other trees on the property. They have several mature trees. The committee's recommendation is to uh, conditionally approve uh, uh, the uh, removal of both trees uh, as proposed in the application. Thank you. Questions of staff? Comments? A motion? I just want to clarify in the, the comments in our packet, it said the committee recommended the commission approve the removal of both trees, blah, blah, uh, as long as they replace each with two trees. That makes it sound like they're going to replace each tree with two trees, giving us four trees, which would be great, but I don't think that's the applicant's intent. Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Clark, that, that's a typographical error. There, it, was, it was as proposed. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, I will make a motion to conditionally approve the removal of the trees um, based on the condition that they replace it as stated in the application. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. That brings us to C1. And for this item, we do have a speaker, so we will have him after we hear the staff presentation. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, at 2433 Kai Soria, the uh, owners of the property are requesting to remove a small fig tree that is adjacent to the uh, garage and uh, three large eucalyptus trees. Um, the committee uh, reviewed the application, did a site visit. Um, the committee struggled with the largest tree in, in the foreground of this photo. Um, the, the problem was the applicant is concerned for the safety of people. And at the base of the tree, the trunk is covered up by soil and ivy, so it was difficult to determine whether or not the tree was, uh, is destabilized or, or, or safe. The uh, committee felt that it was important to retain some canopy in the, in the area, so uh, their recommendation was to approve the fig tree and the two uh, smaller eucalyptus uh, without prejudice uh, and deny the larger eucalyptus. The without prejudice was, uh, the purpose of that was to allow uh, the owners to seek some professional help in, in evaluating the tree and allow them to uh, get, uh, come back for a decision on that tree without having to reapply for the, uh, the, uh, applica uh, through the application process. Um, I met with the property owners after the committee's recommendation to explain what the recommendation meant to them and, and what their options were proceeding from that point. Um, and uh, they asked that uh, we return to inspect the tree once they remove the ivy. Um, that occurred, uh, so we went back out and inspected the tree. Um, what we found uh, was that when we dug around near the tree, we dug around 18 inches deep, we did not find any tree roots in that first 18 inches. That means the tree's buried. Uh, and when a tree trunk is buried and the roots aren't near the surface, the, uh, it's a, a optimal condition for decay. So in this right photograph, it's a little hard to see, but there's a, a, a dark line where I'm pointing out here. That is an area where the decay in the trunk is advancing to. Everything below that dark line right here was soft and punky, which means that the trunk of the tree is, is decayed. Um, 
So staff has provided a separate recommendation, uh, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, the owners are desiring to uh, redo the backyard, and um, they're, they have limited available funds at this time, so they were going to phase the project. So uh, in my discussions with them about the recommendation, they expressed an interest in providing replacement trees once, the, once they redid their backyard. Um, and so I discussed with them the possibility of maybe replacing with something fairly large, maybe something that could achieve 40 feet in height, and they were amenable to that. So staff recommends that all of trees be approved for removal on the condition that they plant a replacement tree that can achieve 40 feet in height and that the last tree is not removed until such time that they're ready to move forward with the uh, installation of the replacement tree. So the staff's recommendation is, is that and the committee's recommendation is to approve uh, the two eucalyptus and the fig without prejudice and uh, deny the third eucalyptus. I'm a little confused. So yeah. staff recommendation is to remove all the eucalyptus trees. But if, if the biggest one is unsafe, that should go first, correct? It's staff's recommendation that that one be the first one to be removed. OK. Um, but the motion allows an opportunity for the owner to select which, which order he would remove the trees if the commission concurs. Okay. Does everybody understand that? Yes, please. Are you recommending the replacement with one tree or multiple trees? S staff's recommendation is for one tree that can achieve a minimum 40 feet in height. Other questions of staff before we um, have the owner up? Mr. Smith, come on up. Am I sitting on the wrong side of the room? Or? No, you're no. <laughs> Just it doesn't not quite. matter. The staff all likes to sit close to the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, we just would like to be able to move forward with the removal of the trees. It is a, um, a fear that we have. Uh, that they are very large relative to the property and we would like to uh, have them removed and then i understand what mr downey said in terms of having replacement a replacement tree or trees uh ready to plant before uh, we take the last trees out so if 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 i'm understanding that correctly then uh, that would be a great result for us and okay. we're hoping to plant trees that uh, build back the canopy and and are more to uh, California Santa Barbara tradition of oak and sycamore and things like that okay thank you thank you can I ask a yes sure he missed. what is uh, I know he mentioned you're gonna phase the project what's your time frame well that's a great question uh, we're hoping within, well, what we don't want to do is take all the trees out and then wait three months or to, to put the replacement trees in. So we're hoping we can accomplish this so that the optimal time to plant would be in the fall. And so within three to four months, uh, and working with uh, the staff and working with the street tree advisory committee uh, coming up with the replacement trees is is that the is that a good answer <laughs> or an appropriate answer? Yeah, I was answer? just curious. <laughs> I think yeah. the removal of all of the trees is also going to happen sort of in phases or all at once. Is that or what, what's your plan? If we would like it to be all at once, if we can have the replacement trees ready to plant as soon as the larger trees come out, mm -hmm. uh, so that makes the most sense to us because that would be the most economical to us in terms of the cost of removing the trees. So, uh, but I also have uh, people in my family that are afraid of an absolutely very large tree falling on the house or the property or people. So I ha one sort of makes waiting 
more difficult, but I, I hope that we would be able to achieve all of this in three or four months, like I said. And the large tree, if we can have it come out because of its condition, we would probably incur the additional cost of having t two different times where they come out to take the trees out. Okay. okay. Thank you. And any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Um, comments from the commission. I am more comfortable with this recommendation, having read the request and um, then to go out and look at the site and see that the tree that was going to be left was, of course, the only one that, not the only one, but the one they were most concerned about and that the neighbor was most concerned about did make me uncomfortable. So. Um, I'm supportive of this new recommendation. I also was um, thought the front of the house was well landscaped. Um, they have some nice large trees in the front of the house that um, tell me they're homeowners that are happy to maintain their foliage. So, so do we have a motion? Uh, yes, of course. Is, is there a process? in which you give feedback to the residents that have con expressed their concern about taking the trees down? Do they, are they going to be notified that actually the tree is diseased and it is a risk so they can not feel so bereft when they see this gorgeous tree down? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Clark, uh, we're always open to providing information. Uh, the one letter we received that is in opposition to the removal is anonymous, so that would be difficult for us. But, yeah. um, but uh, <laughs> you know, we're always open to answering those questions and, and communicating with the public. Okay, great. Plus, they're probably watching right now, so they know that, right? <laughs> so, with that, I would like to make a motion that we approve the removal of the trees on the application with the new condition that at the time of the last eucalyptus tree is removed, a replacement tree that can achieve 40 feet in height be planted. Does that cover all the bases? Okay, is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes. You have your tree removed. You can work with Mr. Downey on that. Um, now we're to D1. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, uh, at 1308 East John and Ollie Street, the uh, applicant is requesting to remove three l mature trees. Um, the, the one in the foreground, it, it, well, they're so crowded it's difficult to get all three pictures uh, in the picture, but uh, the one in the foreground is the, is the uh, African fern pine. Um, he also has a Canary Island pine and a, a Monterey pine. The Monterey pine is the far, uh, far portion of this picture uh, on the right side behind the, the front tree is within just a couple of feet of the foundation of the home. Um, there's concerns for that tree uh, in that it is so close that it's going to impact the foundation. The um, uh, general uh, concern for all three trees is that it severely shades the yard and, and makes it pretty much unusable and unplantable for other things. Um, the Canary Island pine is underneath those high voltage wires you see, uh, and it is a species that grows upright in nature. And because it's directly underneath the high voltage lines, it's been turned into a smaller version of some other species of pine, uh, visually at least. Um, the African fern pine has also been trimmed partially by uh, Southern California Edison crews to maintain the safety of the lines. Um, the complaint on that one also is uh, concern for the fruit drop and uh, the condition of the sidewalk and the uh, wall that borders the properties cracked in places around these trees. The committee looked at the trees and determined that the statement that the yard is, is overly shaded is true, um, that the uh, 
Edison Company has pretty much taken the Canary Island pine out of its natural character. Um, and uh, the tree that's close to the foundation uh, will likely cause that foundation damage. So their recommendation is to approve the two pine trees and deny the African fern pine. The reasons for denying the African fern pine was that they determined that through some uh, maintenance of the tree, they could significantly reduce the fruit drop and and open the tree up so that it would provide a little more light and the neighborhood wouldn't be completely denuded with uh, canopy. So the recommendation is to partially approve the application uh, to approve the two pine trees and deny the African fern pine. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? I, I think there was also an additional reason for leaving denying the removal of the it says Afrocarpus here, but when we were talking on the street, I think they were calling it Podocarpus because it helps camouflage that telephone pole that's right in front. That would be stark and just out there without it. That was another reason to leave that tree. Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Clark, that's correct. Um, just to clarify, the uh, there's been studies done recently with DNA tests on trees, so a lot of trees have been renamed. Um, this is one of those. It used to be called Podocarpus gracilior, and now it is called Afrocarpus because of DNA sampling and, and figuring out it actually belongs to a different family. So that's, that's why there's differences in those names. Yeah. Okay. We learned something new. Um, a motion. Do I? I'll make a motion to um, approve the removal of both pines and deny the removal of the Afrocarpus gracilior fern pine. Second. I'll second Formerly that. known as. And we have a second. Arm Bruster. Yes. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have a street tree designation. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, Quaterna Road uh, was a road that has never been designated for uh, the species to be planted. Um, the parkways are about 10 feet wide, which is extremely large for uh, parkways in, in town. Um, the original request came from a property owner that wants to plant a couple trees. Um, and verbally, they mentioned to me that they would like, uh, they were interested in coast live oak, and that is why on your materials that that is the uh, the species in, in the request. Um, after the submission to the Street Tree Advisory Committee, they sent the, the uh, a, a an email indicating they'd like to have um, the crepe myrtles considered because they like the crepe myrtles. Um, the committee uh, visited the site. Um, they determined that crepe myrtles are fine trees, but they're much too small for the available parkways out there. Um, with the interest in uh, the urban forest management plan uh, increasing diversity, the committee uh, felt that maybe uh, Eagleman Oak, or excuse me, Engelman Oak uh, would uh, be an opportunity to do that. We currently have one of those species in our uh, inventory, um, and this would be an opportunity to increase the numbers of that species in the community. Um, so their, their uh, recommendation is to uh, approve uh, Quercus uh, <coughs> Engelmanii, Eagleman, Engelmanii, Oak, I have trouble with that name, I don't know why, uh, as the designated tree for Paterna Road. Um, the existing plant palette is uh, mostly brush cherries that have been uh, more formally pruned than most street trees. Um, and the concern about those was that they drop a lot of fruit. Um, other concern that wasn't actually stated, but but um, it's also fairly small for that large parkway. Um, staff does support the, uh, the committee's recommendation. Thank you. Um, questions or discussion? Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Derry, um, I know everybody thinks the drought is over, and 
it's not, and I think I've said it before, that we kind of live in a desert. So can you expand a little bit on the suitability of that tree, like it's, it's native suitability, the amount of water that would be used to, to get something like that up and running? Certainly, uh, Chair Long Street and Commissioner Cavazos, um, before I get into the details about this tree, I wanna remind everybody that watering trees is one of the things that we are actually increasing during the drought, not decreasing. Um, but uh, any tree, regardless of its capabilities to uh, survive on lower amounts of water, uh, requires significant amounts of water to establish when they're young. So it doesn't matter which species designated, it needs water to get established. But once trees become established, they become much more drought resistant. This is a species that is native to uh, low rainfall areas and uh, is very drought resistant. And then uh, another question, I know we've done this before. There's nothing stopping a co-designated tree down the line, correct? Uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Cavazos, the, the process we're here for today is certainly a process that could be explored down the line if, if conditions change. There's always opportunities to uh, suggest other trees be designated on a street and they can go through that process as well. Okay. Any other questions? Then I would entertain a motion regarding this. Um, I'll make a motion to um, concur with the um, committee's recommendation for changing the designation and also the staff recommendation. Okay. To the Engelman Oak. To the Oak. Engelman Oak. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, is there a second to the motion? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. And that concludes our tree items today. And we are at item four, director's report for information. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, I'm going to move through this report uh, pretty quickly, and then we'll get to the budget presentation. Um, you have four items, um, and really to highlight some of the volunteer work that uh, went on in our park and recreation system in the last month. First of all, at Alice Keck Park Memorial Garden, this is an annual volunteer day. We have the Church of Latter-day Saints uh, joins us. This is their eighth year. They come out and they volunteer, um, bringing their members of their congregation And this year they had 40 members. We also have staff, as you can imagine, that support this. Santos Escobar has developed a really good relationship with this church group. We also have other staff that are involved, people like Ramiro Arroyo, Kathy Fry, um, and other staff that participate in the event. And then State Trails Day. Um, some of you have been on the commission for a while know that we spend a number of years working with county parks and the Forest Service to really move forward with our Front Country Trails management efforts. We're in a bit of a hiatus right now, and but we do continue to focus on volunteer days and volunteer events. Steve Biddle in our um, department has taken the lead, and then they, he's done training with staff, and then he's also had other staff involved. And in this event, I really want to point out that we have one volunteer, Dave Everett, who is out there on a regular basis documenting the conditions of our trails, and he really followed those conditions through the rain events. And then the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers is critical to a lot of the volunteer trail maintenance that, that occurs. Um, so we're really appreciative of their volunteer efforts. And then also the fact that our Parks Division staff are stepping up and really wanting to own trail maintenance and trail management as well. And then every year we have an Easter egg hunt, as you might know, and so that's something that the Recreation Division staff are involved in. This year, as we have in prior years, had that event at two parks, so at Chase Palm Park, which is sort of the major <coughs> event, and then also uh, Bonet <coughs> Park, and we team with the Santa Barbara Firefighters Association and the Santa Barbara Police Officers Association. At Bonet, we also team up with the United Boys and Girls Club to do this event. And as you can see from the report, 400 
100 children got to look for candy and chocolate and go home with some fun things, and it was a huge success. Um, the mayor and council member Kathy Murillo also participate. And then pickleball, the commissioners may remember last year we did a site tour and we converted one of the tennis courts at Municipal Tennis to four pickleball courts. Well, uh, the pickleball activists have come forward and they would like four more courts, as you can imagine. Uh, it has grown from 78 members to 150 over the last couple of years. And we, we, we fronted the cost for that first set of courts and they're stepping up and making a donation, I believe it's $9,000. Um, to build the next four courts. So there's a perfect example of where they can come in and work with us in terms of the kind of improvements that are needed to expand the sport. And Municipal Tennis Center has the, has the space at the moment to do that. So we'll be moving forward with that. That's something that Rich Hanna has been in the lead on. And so we're, we're, we're proud of it moving forward. And if I recall correctly, I think we're the only ones with pickleball, public pickleball courts in the South Coast. So we're behind the times in other communities, but we're ahead of our colleagues north and south of us. And then lastly, there will be a press conference uh, on Friday. The Foresters are going to be coming to Pershing Park for the summer. This is something we've been working on with City College and the Foresters probably for the last nine months, and it's something that Rich has also taken the lead on. We're really pleased that it all came together. Everybody's sort of pitching in and doing their part. Uh, and the schedule starts with June 9th, and it goes all the way through uh, August 23rd. What we're hoping is, number one, lots of community members will come out. It's a great opportunity. Otherwise, you would have had to go out to UCSB. And number two, it's another example of how we can increase the use of our parks and encourage activity in our parks uh, throughout the summer so that more people can enjoy them and maybe we dissuade some of the misuse activities that we experience there. Um, Commissioner Cavazos is also working on, I'll give him a quick plug, on some youth concert events um, in the band shell in the Plaza del Mar. So there's two parks, Plaza del Mar and Pershing Park. So we're really hoping that those parks are going to be hopping places to be this summer. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions or comments? Mr. No, she kind of stole my thunder. I wasn't actually going to plug it yet, but no, I, I'm very excited about the, the Forester saying I think uh, Bill Pintard runs a, a great program. Uh, and in, if you think of that park and it's how perfect. it's underutilized, it's an awesome thing. I will keep you posted on the, the music thing, but we're trying to incorporate a youth music uh, angle there at Plaza Del Mar. It's a lot of excitement about what we're doing, and I haven't really shared the Forester stuff, but I am personally excited about that. And then my other comment, kind of tying into baseball, uh, Mr. Hanna, is the pickleball expansion. It's not going to impact baseball fields soon, right? We're covered there. <laughs> uh, but it, Surfaces you know, are different. Stuff, <laughs> so the, the, I, I like pickleball. I think it's a great idea, and what you guys have done is cool. I just want to make sure that you know tennis isn't impacted. So there, And I think I heard Ms. Zachary say there's enough room for, for both going on there, and everybody's kind of getting along. There's no rivalries taking place. So, all right. Good job. I think it's exciting to have the activity down at Pershing Park and Plaza Del Mar, and um, thank you for, I know that's a lot of work to get these things going, and, you know, I remember the year they had the 4th of July at, at um, Plaza Del Mar, and that was really cool, um, right down at the beach, so it's nice to see things coming back. Thank you for all that work. All right. We're ready for budget. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, I'm going to start off with a few slides and then Cameron Benson, our Creeks Manager, is going to talk about the Creeks Division. Um, we'll stop there and give an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, as uh, Commissioner Martinez Cohen indicated, the Creeks Advisory Committee meeting is also this evening, so Cameron does need to leave to go to that meeting. So um, if we could start with the first slide. Thank you. So the mission of the Parks and Recreation Department is to provide clean and safe parks, beaches, and recreation facilities to enhance Santa Barbara's beauty, to promote stewardship of resources, and to provide quality recreation and cultural experiences and community services to 
improve the quality of life for Santa Barbara residents. That's a very long sentence. Um, we probably could keep going and say a lot more things, but that sort of captures enough of our mission. We have um, three funds. Actually, we have four funds, including the miscellaneous grants funds. But our main funds are the Creeks Fund, the Golf Fund, and the General Fund. And then we also have capital. So capital is held in a separate capital outlay account. So it shows up separate from our operating budget. When you look at our department, um, in addition to the director and the assistant director, we have five management positions, recreation, business, parks, and creeks, 19 programs. We have 92.45 permanent FTE staff. That's our proposal going into fiscal year 18. And 110,000 hourly hours. So when you think of that, it sounds like a lot. It is a lot, and a bulk of those hours are in our recreation division. When you look at our budget um, as a department, the total department's budget proposed for fiscal year 18 is 24.5 million. When, that, when you break that down by fund, uh, we have 4.6 for the Creeks Fund, 2.8 for the Gulf Fund, just under 600,000 for our miscellaneous grants fund, and then um, 16.45 for the general fund. When you look at revenue by fund, this is where it gives you a sense of, of how, how each fund operates differently. The revenue for the golf fund essentially is revenue that's generated at the golf course. So it's considered an enterprise fund, so all money coming in and all money expended is golf fund, and so essentially nets out. And then for the Creeks Fund, uh, funds for Creeks uh, operating and capital primarily, there are some grant funds, which uh, Cameron will go into, comes from Measure B, so our bed tax. And as you can see, that the proposed revenue for next year is just over $4 million, but the actual expenditures are higher than that. We have a reserve account, a reserve fund for Creeks, and every year in the, res in, in the budget analysis, sometimes funds are used from reserve to support the capital program. And then when you look at um, the general fund, we have just over $5 million in revenue that comes in to support our program. So that shows you that we have a, a general fund subsidy of just over $11 million. So to make our department work and function, um, a certain amount of revenue has to come in for the general fund operating uh, budgets. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cameron, and he'll tell you about the plans for 18 for Creeks. Thank you, Jill. Madam Chair, Commissioners, my name is Cameron Benson. I'm the Creeks Division Manager, and I'll be presenting the Creeks Division proposed budget for FY 18 and 19 this evening. Um, uh, first of all, as most of you know, almost all of the funding for the Creeks Division comes from a voter approved Measure B, which was passed in November of 2000. It's a, a 2% hotel bed tax. Uh, those funds are placed into a special fund and restricted to pay for stormwater and surface water quality improvements and creek restoration projects. Uh, the Creeks Division receives no funding from the general fund. And uh, the budget that I'm going to present to you tonight is consistent with Measure B and, and uh, also consistent with the uh, Creeks program funding guidelines. So uh, getting into the numbers, I'll start with our revenue. Our, the Creeks Division revenue is forecast by the Finance Department. Uh, as you can see, uh, comparing the first column, which is our current year FY17 adopted budget, uh, to the recommendation for FY18, which is the fourth uh, column, uh, finance department is actually projecting measure B revenues to decrease. And so because that is almost all of the revenue for, uh, for the Creeks Division, we're looking at uh, approximately $100,000 decrease in revenue from the current fiscal year to next fiscal year. Uh, I wanted to note uh, while we're talking about the revenue that, that the projections do not include any uh, pending or future grant applications that we, that we may submit, and it's just too speculative for us, as we're always in a competitive grant process, so we don't we don't include that 
those funds until we actually have them. And um, on the expenditure side, the proposed FY18 budget is substantially similar to the FY17 adopted budget. Uh, you can see there are a few, a few differences. Um, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and try to point to those. Uh, the, the biggest change from the current year budget to, to the proposed budget for next year is our capital uh, transfer for our capital program. We are increasing that from 1,475,000 to 1,925,000, a $450,000 increase. Um, the other major difference comes in our supplies and services. Uh, that $100,000 increase uh, in, the, in the proposed budget for next year really amounts to two line items. We have uh, uh, two one-time costs in our, um, proposed in our budget that are related to the city's stormwater discharge permit. One is a water quality public opinion survey that we're required to do under our permit every five years. That's about half of that cost. The other half is a is um, money we are, are proposing to set aside for technical updates to our stormwater guidance manual, which is part of our stormwater management program um, and our, our stormwater permit. Again, that's a, a, a five-year permit. We're coming up to an update on that permit, so we, we think we may have to um, update that guidance manual a little bit. And so uh, other than that, the, the budget is, uh, is almost identical. Here's how our proposed FY18 operating budget breaks out into our program areas. The Creeks Division has three main program areas. We have water quality improvement, creek restoration, and community outreach and education. About 50%, 51% of their operating budget goes to water quality improvement programs. Uh, about uh, a quarter of it, 24%, goes to creek restoration programs, and, and uh, the other quarter goes to community outreach. Um, so, so just to sum up some of our, our proposed budget highlights, we have an increase in our capital improvement program transfer of $450,000 from the current year. We have a, about a $100,000 decrease in our Measure B revenue uh, forecast. We have a water quality survey and our stormwater treatment manual update, both of which are, are one-time costs. Those will disappear in FY19. Um, and then, as uh, Ms. Zachary mentioned, our our proposed budget is about 4.6 million. Our, our, rep, our revenue forecast is about $4 million. We have $600,000 that we're proposing to transfer from our reserve to uh, largely to fund our capital budget increase. I'll talk a little bit more about the reserve balance uh, in a moment, but I do want to let you know, I, I did look back to see that this is a, a practice we have used in the past. I did look back to see how often we had used it over the last 10 years. And uh, in about half of the budget years, we, we do transfer funds from our reserve to, to our capital program. So this is kind of a standard practice for us. Um, speaking of our capital program, this is our, 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 these are the proposed projects in our FY18 and 19 capital program uh, we're proposing for funding. There are a lot of projects on there. I just wanted to highlight a, a few of those. Um, first, uh, the stormwater treatment retrofit projects. Uh, you all are, are familiar with a number of demonstration projects we've done throughout the city in terms of uh, permeable pavers and kind of ubiquitous hardscape in the city. So we've done parking lots, we've done alleyways, we've done sidewalks, and we've even done uh, streets in the city with permeable pavers. Those were intended to be a demonstration project to uh, identify ways to, to allow um, runoff to be treated naturally and um, uh, not have pollute off, polluted runoff running into the storm drains and into the creeks and ocean. Uh, we're moving on from permeable pavers and we're looking at doing some new demonstration projects using dry wells where we can capture some of that runoff water from, from right away areas from streets primarily. Uh, and allow that water to be treated naturally in the soil, collected and treated naturally in the soil, 
and uh, also we're, we're looking for opportunities to potentially restore groundwater, uh, recharge groundwater using those. Um, uh, number four on the list is a Royal Borough Open Space Restoration Project. That is a, a parcel that the city purchased uh, a little over a year ago. We are currently working on uh, technical studies and conceptual design. We should be back to the commission sometime this summer with, a, with some conceptual design and uh, to discuss that project. And then last on the list is the Andre Clark Bird Refuge. That's another project we're, we're actively moving forward on right now. We have uh, completed some technical studies. We expect within the next month or so to receive some conceptual design plans that we'll be able to take a look at, take out to the public, and, um, and discuss and move forward with. This chart shows our funding sources for, our, for the Creeks Division Capital Program over the past several years. Uh, the, the blue part of the bar is the Measure B portion of the funding for our capital program. The, um, I don't know what to call that color, fuchsia purple <laughs> color is, a, uh, is the grant funding we've, we've been able to uh, secure for capital projects. And as you can see, that, that varies every year, but we have been uh, very, very successful. I don't think there's been any year since the Creeks Division has been established where we got completely skunked. Even that one in the middle, FY14, there's a tiny little $10,000 uh, <laughs> grant that we received. <laughs> so, um, but we have, had, we have had several years in which we've received more, uh, more grant funding than we've received through Measure B. So we've been able to more than double the money in, uh, in some years. And uh, over the over the history of, of Measure B since uh, 2001, we've we've been able to um, we've successfully received over 18 and a half million dollars in in grant funding, and uh, the Creeks Division staff does really scour through opportunities for for grant funding, and this is federal, state, and private foundation grant funding that that fits with our projects and programs, and we'll continue to do that just to leverage the Measure B funds uh, for the greatest benefit we can for the community. So our, our reserve balance is projected to be uh, about $3.8 million at the end of this year. The, the purpose of the Creeks Fund Reserve is, re is really to fund capital projects to use for grant matches and to, um, to cover revenue shortfalls in, in more lean years. Uh, the Creeks Advisory Committee has set up a recommendation for us to maintain a, a reserve balance of, a, what they, of what we consider two large projects. And so that, uh, as a dollar amount, is about $3 million. So that's a target that we try to keep in our, in our reserve fund. Um, over the course of the next two years, we're looking at using about $900,000 in, in reserves, largely, again, to fund the capital program. Uh, and so we're projecting a reserve balance at the end of FY19 of just under 2.9 million. So pretty close to right on target. And, and to the extent we are using the reserve funds, we're using them for the, the stated purpose of the reserve. So as has been mentioned, the Creeks Advisory Committee will be hearing this presentation in a half hour. And um, <laughs> we'll be able to provide a recommendation to, to you. We, we, uh, we did have our meeting scheduled last week, but we, we don't do this presentation to the committee until the uh, city council has received the budget presentation, so we'll, we'll be doing that this evening. Uh, I did want to let you know that the, the budget subcommittee for the Creeks Advisory Committee did meet on March 15th and, and went through a detailed review line by line of the budget. The committee uh, did, or the subcommittee did, unanimously support the the proposed budget um, to the Creeks Advisory Committee. So, perhaps if the commission is so inclined, the you could make a recommendation subject to the support of the Creeks Advisory Committee. I think that's what we've done in the past when we had this situation. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Do we have any questions for Mr. Benson? I have a question. Do you anticipate that any of the use of um, the reserves, that there'll be grants coming in to lessen that for the next two years? 
Sure, Chair Longstreet. Um, that is, that has happened in the past, and um, and it's, you know, what do they say in fin the finance world? Past performance doesn't guarantee future uh, returns or whatever. But that's <laughs> that's what we have done in the past, and um, and that's how our reserve ends up becoming so large. Sometimes is is um, I mean, we, we have a project that, a uh, creek restoration project that we did on the municipal golf course property, for example, um, that we were fully funding through Measure B, and then right as we were starting construction, we ended up receiving a grant that covered 100% of the cost of that project. And so we were able to uh, take that money that had already been appropriated and put it back into the, into the reserve fund. So that does happen. I, I seem to remember that happening. <laughs> Um, other questions or comments? It's, it, I think that we should just all be thankful to the voters of Santa Barbara that we have Measure B and a Creeks thank you. division. So um, thank you for running it so well. And we, are we going to do all of our recommendations at one time, or do you want to do them fund by fund? Uh, Chair Longstreet and commissioners, we have it as all at once, but okay. if the commission wants to be able to share with the Creeks Advisory Committee your thoughts, as uh, Mr. Benson indicated, um, you can do that as well. It's, I would okay. leave it up to you. I would look to the, what's the pleasure of the commission? Do you want to do it all at one time, or would you like to vote on this? Um, I, I am comfortable with this budget because I, you know, I was liaison to Creeks for a while, and I know they watch the money. So if it came through the, the budget committee, I know that it's been vetted quite well, so. Yeah, and I would uh, just make a comment. I was at that subcommittee meeting, and they do really do go through yes. line by line. Um, and I think we should probably vote on it now so that okay. you can take the news back to the committee. Would you like to make a motion to that effect? Yes, I would. Okay. Um, so I will move that we would um, make the recommendation to accept the Creek's budget subject to the committee's approval. Is that correct? Okay. And recommend it to city council with their... Yes. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, we're going to go back to talking about the general fund, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go on to the golf fund, and then we're going to wrap up with capital. Uh, Mark Sewell, the business manager, is going to present the general fund slides. Also, just as you can tell from the audience, we have Santos Escobar, Judith McCaffrey and Rich Hanna here to be able to answer any questions that you have, um, in particular related to the general fund budget. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Welcome. Longstreet and Commissioners, uh, this is the uh, recommended budget for fiscal year 18 and 19 for the general fund. So the Parks and Recreation Department is responsible for 46% of all of the general funds uh, facilities, parks and buildings and the like. 1,800 acres of parkland, which is 60 parks and sports facilities, 16 buildings, over six miles of beach, four swimming slash wading pools, 22 playgrounds, 33 tennis courts, some pickleball courts obviously coming in there as well now, and over 60,000 street trees and one municipal golf course. So we have quite a broad area of responsibility within the, well, sorry, back up, the golf course isn't in the general fund, I apologize. Uh, we have a broad um, area of responsibility. And so within those facilities, we also provide programs and services. And so we have over 12,000 activity registrations through the year, serving over two and a half thousand children in after school programs. Um, we allow the public to reserve parks and facilities for weddings or picnics or the like parties and we host, host and facilitate over 130 community special events for the city and we also serve over 10,000 households through weekly food distribution and we wouldn't be able to do all of this without the help of a significant number of, of people in the community contributing more than 34,000 hours of their time 
to support our services. And so thank you very much to those people. So key initiatives, um, as we've looked at how we wanted to propose our budget for the next two years, um, is that we've looked at how we structure ourselves and we're recommending some position changes. Um, we have been looking at how we will manage with the, the expected Cabrillo Pavilion closure for re renovation. Um, we're continually looking to improve our customer booking experience and of course we were with you last month sharing with you the improvements we we're making in that front. We're looking to expand the capital and planning projects that we have underway and the new ones we're proposing. We want to continue to try and drive the revenues. It's very important to our department for the delivery of, of some of our programs that we generate revenue in, in a number of areas. And of course, we have to try and balance the books. So a major budget change that we are, are recommending is with regards to the closure and the expected closure of the Cabrillo Pavilion. At this point in time, it's anticipated that from January the 1st, 2018, the building will be closed for at least 18 months. Um, so that will impact six months of fiscal year 18 and the full fiscal year 19. What that means to us, the building generates revenue and so therefore, of course, we're going to be expecting to see a reduction in that revenue of just under a quarter of a million dollars in FY18 and just over half a million dollars in FY19. This is a significant impact to our department budget. But what we have been able to do is identify the direct cost savings, and so we've included those in our budget where, where possible to offset all of the impact in FY18. And we were almost there. We couldn't quite get all the way for FY19, and so therefore there's just over $100,000 that at this time we think we need some support from capital to be able to balance the budget given the half a million dollar reduction in revenue. Other major budget changes are in personnel. There are five position changes that we're recommending to better support the services. Um, and they are the elimination of one position. Now, this position existed when the municipal golf course was operated with city labor. Um, and as part of that transition, that position is no longer required. Um, we are looking to move from 0.8 to 1.0 FTE, a recreation specialist, to improve our service delivery and recreation division. We're looking to reclassify to include a senior recreation supervisor and also to reclassify a park supervisor to a park superintendent and also reclassify to a project planner. And this will allow the, the department to just slightly reorganize itself again to, to uh, enable us to be more reactive to the trends and, and what's actually happening now in the parks and the recreation divisions. And then the final point there is that we're looking to just adjust the reallocations between the general fund and the golf fund for the oversight. So this 0.15 FTE relates to um, the director and the park supervisor from an oversight standpoint with the golf course. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, I'm just going to jump in and, and add a few things. It's outlined in your staff report. You know, the Cabrillo Pavilion, it being closed, you know, we really tried to look for ways to, con and, and we are continuing many programs. So programs are moving elsewhere. We didn't budget any new revenue, for example, at Cabrillo Recreation. We tried to be conservative. We wanted to make sure we weren't overshooting our budget. And then also, we have some position vacancies that we're proposing to keep vacant, including an office specialist position and the um, head pool lifeguard permanent part-time position. We're going to backfill with hourly on the lifeguard as a way to just sort of mitigate that revenue shortfall. And I would also add, we worked with our facilities folks in public works and they reduced you know building maintenance and allocated costs because the building's going to be closed so we really looked at you know what can we do in the short term knowing that once it's up and running we're going to be moving forward with refilling positions because we'll need to do that so a number of staff and recreation in particular are going to, are participating in this short term 
um, strategy. I would also add that um, part of our proposal in terms of uh, reclassification in the senior recreation supervisor is we have a vacant recreation manager position, and we're proposing to keep that vacant again while the building's closed. But at the same time, we recognize that structurally, in order to maintain our services, um, Judith McCaffrey will be shouldering the burden as the recreation manager. How do we make sure that reporting and responsibility framework is more feasible? under those considerations. And then similarly with the park superintendent position, looking at where we are um, with the parks division and realizing that workload has increased dramatically, particularly in the last five years, how do we position ourselves to maintain the services and spread out that responsibility so that we continue to, to be responsive and support the parks manager? I have a question. Do you anticipate when, you, when you're closing in on the completion of Cabrillo Arts, will you, you'll go into a, probably a pretty heavy marketing to make sure that it's, when it's ready to go, it's f as full as possible? Chair Longstreet and commissioners, at some point in the near future, we will come to you and, and share our preliminary operating plan for the for the building when it reopens um, i would say a lot of work is going into the sort of forecasting revenues by use of the building in terms of programs but also special events and then a, a future restaurant operation and how we plan to market and advertise and what types of programs and services we're going to provide the community that's being refined right now and it'll continue to be refined as we go into construction but we anticipate we will be hitting the ground running before the doors open and also strategically determining which door opens first based on what it's going to do. So we might be looking at that as well. Thank you. I have an additional question too. Um, I was curious about some of the programs that are happening there now. What's the plan for why they're gone, especially the junior lifeguards, obviously that's um, it's like one of the main ones. Chair and Commissioners, so the, the plan for right now is to re, um, move the Junior Lifeguard Program down to Ledbetter Beach. It works. There's a parking facility there to accommodate the pickup and drop off. So we'll move the 300 kid Junior Guard Program down to Ledbetter. We'll keep the beach volleyball program operating as is. Um, we'll provide portable restrooms there to support that type of activity. Um, we'll relocate some of our camps and activities to Casa Las Palmas, Chase Palm Park area. We already run Aqua Camp. Our special events, so things like the triathlon, reef and run, those will continue to operate. They'll just kind of move down the parking lot, or we may be using Pershing Park, or not sorry, Pershing, Cabrillo Ballpark mm -hmm. to accommodate the triathlon and just a different section of the beach slightly to the west for reef and run. Mm -hmm. They will have to kind of go back to their original days where they have an event on the sand and they won't have the warm showers that they currently have, but they're excited for what the renovation will bring when we reopen the facility. So the plan is to relocate everything um, and just continue to maintain the programs and the revenue as we projected in this budget presentation. Are there going to be permanent, um, not permanent, but um, restaurant, like porta potties there for the whole time of the renovation or just for certain events? So the plan is to put portable restrooms on the east side of the building supporting beach volleyball for year-round activity because we have year-round activity at the volleyball courts in addition to our summer impacts. Mm -hmm. The facilities that we put on the west side of the facility will probably be seasonal. And when I say seasonal, it's, you know, I'm going to say May through October. Okay. Um, and that way we can support both reef and run and other activities when the beach bikeway path is most active okay. uh, and then we'll have signage so we can direct people around the construction zone if we take the portable restrooms out for that period that's probably late fall and most of winter <laughs> got it makes sense thank you so much okay thank you okay thank you so the chart i put up here shows you um the permanent position within the department um from a couple of years ago in FY16, this year FY17, and what we're recommending for next year. And uh, so you can see that the recommendation within the FY18 budget is actually a 0.45 reduction in the general fund um, for positions. 
So then what does that mean in terms of the dollars and cents? Well, the recommended expense budget for the general fund is 16.45 million, as Ms. Zachary mentioned right at the start of the presentation. And you can see that the parks and the recreation division carry the bulk of that expense. Um, and that 16.45 is actually $1 million lower than the amended budget for FY17. And there's a couple of large items which account for the majority of that $1 million. And so if, if I should just point you to the 854000 on the parks line, there are two key items there which are accounting for that. One is that um, for fiscal year 18, the downtown Santa Barbara Plaza contract has moved from the Parks and Recreation Department to a um, City Hall General Fund Department. And that's a $630,000 contract a year. So 630,000 of that 854 is because that contract is no longer within the Parks and Recreation purview. Okay, so you can see in FY17, it was 8.5 million in parks and, and recommended for FY18, it's 7.7 .7 million. So it's a significant drop of which is that. And then the other portion of that relates to the uh, contribution to the overhired staff resulting from the transfer of the, of the Gulf um, from city maintenance to a, a management contract that happened in July 1st, 2016. So in the fiscal year 17 budget, that was $343,000. And so while there is still some funding for that in recommended in 18, it's not as much, it's about $200,000 less. So when you add those two items up, you've got nearly all of the $850,000 there, okay? Can I ask, um, with the downtown organization contract, does that mean that um, we n we're not charged with having to supervise that anymore? We have nothing, okay. That's, that's correct, Chair Lonick Street, and it's actually in downtown parking, uh -huh. so it's being, it's being overseen by downtown parking staff, but a portion of that contract is funded by the general fund, 50%, and a portion is funded by the downtown parking fund. So you just moved all of the money over to that account, and they're managing it. We're still involved, obviously, because the trees and our landscape expertise, so Santos Escobar will still be involved, but we're not responsible for it anymore. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then one of the main reasons for the recreation reduction is the Cabrillo Pavilion. As we've already shared, we, we've found ways in which we can mitigate the revenue reductions for the closure of that building. So when we look at the revenue for the, for the general fund, 70% of the revenue is generated by the recreation department. And that in the main are, is user fees and fees for renting our buildings and using our camps and all that kind of stuff. And within the parks division, which is just under 30%, uh, a great deal of that revenue is actually um, provided by providing services to either other internal city departments or, or some third parties. The next slide I'm gonna show you kind of breaks a little bit more of that out. Um, and so you can, it's still the 5.3 million in terms of total department revenue, but you can see that recreational programming is the bulk of it. It's just under 2 million. And then we make just over a million from facility rentals. And this includes park rentals as well. It's not just buildings, um, picnic sites and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we then generate just under 400,000 from long-term leases uh, in some of our buildings. Just under a million comes from um, Measure A, from the, the streets division for the maintenance of street trees. And, and then the 614,000 for the other intra-city charges are for things whereby we're maintaining waterfront parking lots or Sheffield Reservoir, um, where we obviously have the expertise within the parks division and, and we can provide that to a, a sister city department. One of the um, things I wanted to share with you as well, I believe this came up at the meeting that you had last week in terms of how does the budget generally work, was to give you some indication as to how does each division and, and ultimately within each division, how does each program, um, how do the revenues and expenses operate and so which programs are funding themselves and which ones aren't and all that kind of thing. So if I just sort of draw your eye to the recreation admin, the top line on there. So this is, these are the programs that exist within the recreation division. And um, you can see that the recreation division right at the bottom generates $3.7 million at a cost of 7.2. And so therefore the general fund is subsidizing the recreation division for 3.5 million, which is about 51%. So the cost recovery 
is about 51% for the recreation division. And this last column here shows you where the, where the swings are. And so within our facility rental and special events, it's almost paying for itself in its entirety. And then you have other support functions like recreation administration where there are no revenues, which of course then it needs a full subsidy. And so you can see that tennis, for example, generates 38% of the revenue required to run the program. And so then without going through every line, of course, it's in, it, it kind of gives you an indication about which areas require much, how much uh, subsidy from the general fund. We then also do the same thing for our administration divisions and for the parks division. And again, with administration, again, there's very little revenue. It's not really selling anything. It's supporting the other operations. So, of course, the cost recovery is low, 7%. That $105,000 there is for when we, we are able to recover project management costs as part of capital projects. And then you can see within the parks division, 20% of the costs are recovered through those relationships I mentioned earlier. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, we, we reviewed this a little bit in um, in your work session last week. I think one of the main differences when you when you look at the parks division and you look at where the revenue is, in forestry, that is utility users tax that comes in to trim street trees. So these are trees in the public right of way. Under medians, again, this is landscape within the public right of way. So we are basically the department that provides that service on behalf of the city. It's not revenue that comes in because we're making, maintaining a park area. And then similarly in grounds maintenance, the revenue that comes in primarily there is because we provide services to maintain landscape and waterfront parking lots, as well as we're, we provide the uh, landscape services for the Sheffield open space. So it's not that parks generate revenue, although they do, it shows up in our recreation uh, program in facilities and special events because that's where the park rental revenue gets placed. So it's, it's, a little, it's a little confusing, but it gives you a sense of, you know, why is there money coming into parks? It's generally as a result of services that we're providing, not necessarily services within parks. Yes, and so therefore the final takeaway on that is that for the whole department, 33% of the total costs are recovered in those revenues. I have a question. Um, is there a target percentage that the department is, is aiming toward? Is there an industry standard? Is there other cities that are hitting better marks? I mean, I'm just curious. It seemed, we talked about at our budget meeting how these are public services that we're providing, and obviously the taxpayers are paying for it through the general fund of the city, which is in transferred parks, um, which makes sense to me. I'm just curious, uh, you know, from a business manager standpoint, if there's some sort of targets or goals that you're looking at or what's normal. I'm, I'll, uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Martinez Cohen, I think a number of us could answer that in a number of different ways. Uh, it's, it's a balancing act. So we are a parks and recreation department. We're here to provide community services. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to balance that with the cost of those services and how much money we get allocated from the general fund. Uh, our recreation staff do a really good job trying to find ways to maximize revenue yet make sure our programs and services are available to the most broad cross-section of the community. So where we would see um, maximizing revenue or having targets, it would be, well, facilities and special events. We want to do that. Why? Because that's something that we want to provide, but really we want to make sure we save some of that general fund allocation for the programs that we can't generate right. revenue right. for because it's really not the purpose. It's more to provide the service. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you looked at recreation departments or parks and recreation departments throughout the country, you'd see a, a variety of, of cost recovery. Uh, at 50%, that's been our goal for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, as a department, we've generally been around 35%. It's a little lower this year. One of the things that, we've, that we are challenged with looking into the next fiscal year is that our facility rental revenues aren't what they need to be to maintain some of the things we've been doing. And so we've had to adjust accordingly mm -hmm. uh, to address that. And of course, 
the Cabrillo Pavilion being closed took a big chunk, so that's an easy write-off. And then, you know, so it all yeah. files, it all sort of flows together as, as ways that we look at it. Okay. And I would also, I, I, the 50% number is something we uh, had talked about for a long time. And in recreation, as I recall, you were achieving that. Mm -hmm. But you think about it, if we started getting too um, tight with that number, we'd see parks saying, well, wait a minute, all those, those rentals in, that are showing up in rec need to come over into our side. So we look at, so it's, it's a real moving target to me. I think it's just great that right there, you have 51%, that's probably the best we'd want to do to still be able to provide the other things we do for. The Chair for Longstreet and Commissioners, if I could just add, it's really difficult to accurately present cost recovery because in those numbers we don't have the cost to maintain the ball field, for example, unless it's, a, unless it's an arrangement that we have with one of our third party, you know, through a co-sponsorship. And even then, it's not in there because there's no money changing hands. It's more that they're providing something that enhances it. But you could split hairs forever and a day over that because... We have the park, and we know we're going to maintain it to a certain standard, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So, so you, we go back and forth, really trying to bring it down. And, and looking at this is the cost to provide recreation services to the community is offset fifty percent by the revenue that they bring in to do that, and we think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. No, having seen the department really change the whole um, way of doing business as far as revenue over the last 20 years, it's been pretty amazing to see it go up as high as it is. So um, I think you're doing a tremendous job in that area. And I always wish there were more we could do for free, so. If we had more time, I would be delighted to talk to you about the nuances of activity-based costing. Um, <laughs> but I think we've probably done it to death enough. Um, <laughs> And so a little more about the budget, I guess. Um, so we mentioned some of these things about how does the park revenue, um, how is it derived? And so it's just over 1.5 million. And for those things we've mentioned earlier, um, recreation revenue again, facility rentals. And we put a pie chart up earlier. That's a significant chunk. That's a, over a million dollars. Um, youth activities. And again, this comes to it. You know, if we were really chasing cost recovery, perhaps we would be charging people a lot more than we are. Um, but we try to make sure we can get as much engagement as possible. Um, and then, you know, we generate revenue in our aquatic section, um, fees to swim, summer camps, and beach guard services. Sports and tennis, there's a fee for those things. If you go want to go to the Korea Recreation Center and take some classes, then of course you, people will pay for that. And then within our neighborhood and outreach services, we do provide a lot of um, free programs because obviously there's a need there. Um, however, we were able to do that because we generate revenue elsewhere um, through leasing space at a very, very good rate to local nonprofits and trying to encourage the community to use those buildings at weekends for celebrations um, and, and the like. And of course, there's often a, a charge for that. So fees and charges, of course, uh, there are 613 recreational program and facility fees. Okay. And as part of the budget for the two years, we have a look at those and we we ask ourselves, okay, are we charging the right amount? Are we recovering enough of our costs? Um, and in the case of 108 of those, we think, yeah, we're fine. Actually, we're proposing not to increase 108 of our fees. However, the vast majority, 505 of them, we are proposing increases. And there'll be a range of reasons why we're proposing those increases. We want to consider, will it impact on participation? Uh, is there a community need for that, and therefore do we need to make sure that we're encouraging people to come in? Does the fee, pay a, a fee into, uh, play a part in that? Sometimes it can be counterintuitive to think raising a fee could help the community, but actually it might. Um, we look at who are we targeting for this particular program or that particular service, and what are the competition doing? We are an exceptionally competitive environment. We, we offer a number of different products and services. You know, if you want to have your wedding in Santa Barbara, I probably can't count the number of opportunities you have in this town to, to select a venue for that, and we're in that market. We also provide camps. Who else provides camps? A number of lots of other people. And so we've got to be aware that what we're offering has to offer value and, va and exceptional value in these days. 
and be convenient for people to be competitive and to generate the revenue we need to operate our programs. So a couple of examples of the fees and charges that we're doing. And we've pulled out the ones which are probably the, the largest outliers just so that you, know, you, can, you can see that and, and bear in mind that the vast majority of the fees that have gone up are around 3% if they've gone up at all. And so you know, picking out some of these, oftentimes when you look at the percentage, it can be a little overwhelming, 25%, that seems like a lot, but when you look at it, it's $3 for the class. So it goes from 12 to 15 for drop-in classes. And it represents the fact that some of these programs and services cost us more than time and effort and as, as we run them a little while, we realize this and we, we figure that, you know, if we're going to continue to do it and, and look at our cost recovery on, on that particular basis, we need to look at the fee. So we're recommending increasing the drop-in passes for dance and fitness from 12 to $15, for example. Ceramics Camp, again, looks like 14%, but we've done a review of the market and we feel like $40 is a really fair fee for that service and that camp. Uh, picnic sites, 30 to $35. And then kitchen rental, 10% from 25 to 27. So again, we're very conscious of the impact on, on the percentage because if, if it's something you're buying a lot of or using a lot of, it can make a big difference. But also bearing in mind what's the competitive market doing and how do we think it's going to impact on, on the ability for people to afford to, to actually use our, our, our services. Can I ask a question? Job. Um, I think when I first started doing the commission stuff, you, we uh, increased the fees. Um, at our, the first budget meeting I was a, a part of. I understand the rationale behind increasing fees, and I agree that the, the change as a percentage is large, but in dollar amounts, it's, it's not, um, it's able to be tackled. But do you see any direct correlations between the last fee increase and a decrease in participation in activities? Uh, yeah, I, I, Chair Long Street and Commissioner Clark, I don't think that we've seen any one particular fee cause a dramatic drop-off in participation. And of course, if we did feel that that was the case, we would very much look at, okay, did we overcook it last year and, and how we want to uh, deal with that? And we wouldn't be adverse to dropping a fee or running promotions if we feel that that's what was required. Um, and oftentimes we'll look at that with our, with our recreation programming and if we're not as full as we'd like to be by a certain point in time, clearly price could be an impact in that. And so we, as you would expect any business, we'll look at it and say, is there a promotion we can run which drops the fee to try to, to generate more, um, more demand? And so that's the marketplace we're in in a number of our um, discretional services, i.e. do I want my son or daughter to go on this camp or that camp? Um, Clearly, we, ha we just want to be very ca cautious and, and cognizant of our ability to fund ourselves and still provide enough funding for the services which don't bring any fees in. And, of course, the only way to do that is by making sure we can recover fees that aren't, you know, ensure we're not loss-making in all areas. So moving on to the miscellaneous grants fund, um, this is an area whereby the department receives donations and contributions from individuals and, and foundations um, and potentially state and federal um, organizations. And so within FY18, we have recommended uh, a grants fund of $582,000 in terms of expense, and that's offset in full by revenue. So basically, it's a balanced fund because we would spend what we expect to recover. And primarily the bulk of that is within our youth areas in terms of after school programs, the AOK program, adapted programs and summer recreation programs, which are, we don't receive a fee for. Um, within there as well, there are other smaller programs which we operate primarily um, through the neighborhood outreach services section, such as the Arts Alliance, Youth Council, Job Apprentice programs. Um, we have a, a Russ Morrison Junior Golf Program where we provide subsidized golf lessons and, and, and opportunities for people to get into golf. And then there are other areas where the, the funds are actually used to enhance our parks and our, 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 our landscapes. So in response to, I'm sure this isn't much news to everyone, um, if you've been following um, the, where the council and, and where the budget is looking. In response to some, some sort of headwinds coming in terms of taxation revenues that the city's looking at, um, all departments were looked, were in general fund departments, were asked to look at their um, cost base. And we were directed by the city administrator to, to bring forward some reductions based on 1% of our total costs. Um, 
in, in order to assist the city to you know, balance the budget based on the challenges they were seeing with things like sales tax and, and, and bed tax. And so 1% of our expense budget in FY18 is $167,000, and 1% of our FY19 is $171,000. And so when we were looking at that challenge, we wanted to make sure that we were able to, wherever possible, maintain services and, and continue to invest in our facilities so that we don't you know, detract from people wanting to continue to, to use our services and, and, and also book our, our facilities. We also um, looked at retaining the flexibility within the staff resources. And so what we've recommended for FY18 um, is that we are going to recommend transferring $145,000 to the Gulf Fund from the General Fund. Um, sorry, the other way around, from the Gulf Fund to the General Fund as the remaining balance for the staff who were transferred to the general fund at the point in which the golf course was taken over by a management company. And so that 145,000 has come about because there were a number of staff who were actually absorbed into the parks division this fiscal year, in fiscal year 17, which meant that the golf fund was not charged the full amount in FY17. And the further, the final 22,000 there to make up the difference is we're looking to, wherever, wherever we can, just reduce hourly staff to meet that 1% requirement. Now, we anticipate, as most has, happens in most years, that there may be some absorption of those staff who are still overhired in the um, parks division within fiscal year 18, and so therefore the actual impact to the Gulf Fund may be less than the $145,000. So it's a similar situation that we were in last year when we were saying, okay, there's $343,000 last year, and with absorption that happened in FY17, it actually turned into $200,000, which left us the $145,000, which we are suggesting helps us, helps us with our 1% reduction. Chair Longstreet and, and um, commissioners, what what we will find when we absorb those two staff and the 145,000 doesn't re represent the full cost of those two positions. So the general fund is um, still paying for a portion of those two positions that haven't been absorbed. That once they are, and that sounds weird, absorbed. So someone may leave. Or may and leave to go to another job, or more likely, we, we anticipate some additional retirements. So we would move staff into those vacant positions once um, the retiree leaves city service, and the position they're currently holding would be removed from the budget. So it would be eliminated. So ultimately, we'd achieve the savings over the long term, which we've which we anticipate would, would happen. It just gives us a little bit of buffer initially, knowing that um, we'll likely absorb them and therefore through that absorption, the Gulf Fund will be, will, the transfer cost will go down, the general fund cost will also go down too because those positions will be eliminated. Um, if we're using it this year to, to um, achieve the reduction, right? That's what I'm getting. If they're absorbed, then does the reduction have to come somewhere else? Or does just the position going away take care of it? Okay. So, yeah, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, the position goes away and that's counted as a reduction because the positions were added to the general fund. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Oh, and Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, that ends our capital, I mean, our general fund presentation. Uh, Mark Sewell will go into golf, unless you would like to stop and ask questions about the general fund before we do that. Let's stop. Uh, since we started with Creeks that way, let's do the general fund um, and break this into pieces, and then we'll go into golf. Questions? Anyone? Well, I have a comment. <clears throat> okay. So I brought this up in the, in the work session. And I think, uh, you know, pe people will catch on to this, but, you know, one of the biggest things that stood out to me was when you look at the revenue versus the expenditures, the expenses, you know, we're kind of 
off there, and I think that raised a red flag. I mean, we understand why, and I think my fellow commissioners would agree. You know, the things you guys are doing are great. The, you know, the facilities uh, are great. Our parks are awesome. And I think it was uh, Chair Longstreet who said, you know, while well, we could make it up in like, you know, fees or, you know, gate fees, and I think then you have another problem, you know, because everybody's going to freak out. I mean, if we charge $10 million to sign up for soccer or something that you guys run, good, our budget's a, it's a wash, but you, you guys can't do that. So all I would recommend is to continue finding ways to, to whittle down, you know, expenses wherever you can increase fees wherever you can to get those numbers closer i think that's it um again i think everything that, that you guys do on the recreation side on the facility side everything's great and where it should be i think people would agree that you know it's it's what we want but that would just be my only recommendation find a way wherever we can down the road or you know to try and get those numbers closer other I, I will go uh, when going through the um, budget by programs. I noticed a theme throughout. As it go, we go farther out in the years, and that is the reduction in hourly time. Um, I get it that with minimum wage going up, that just means less time that we get people. If we saw if there's no more money to pay them. It seems to me and that this is going to really impact services and how how we do things. And um, I don't think there's an answer to it, but I do want us to acknowledge that this is going to be a crisis in let's, parks, in maintenance. I, I see it in youth activities, um, a big drop in um, hourly. And I think it's... Um, is it, are we going to lessen program? How, how is this going to be absorbed? It's, the impacts are going to be pretty great. we need an extra half a million dollars to continue to provide the programs because we'll be meeting the new minimum wage requirements, how are we going to get that? How are we going to get there? So we don't have an answer. I anticipate that this time next year we'll be talking to you a little bit more about that and then the following year we'll be talking a lot about that. So we're very cognizant that there could be change um, and, and the impact largely is in recreation because that's where the bulk of our hourly hours. Mm -hmm. The change in hourly hours that you're seeing for this coming year has to do with some program shifting that we did and ways for us to address. We mentioned early, earlier in the presentation, um, perhaps it wasn't as clear as it could have been, is as a result of looking at our costs and our revenues, we've had to make a program, some programmatic adjustments and that has reduced our need for those hourly hours, so therefore the numbers have gone down. And then with the Cabrillo Pavilion, we've reduced hourly hours because we're not going to need them. And then similarly in our other facilities where we're not necessarily getting the revenue to support, we've reduced those costs, so we do look at that. One of the key challenges, um, besides the fact that revenues for the city, in many cases, particularly sales tax, are declining, flat, uh, is that is that salary and benefit costs are going up, particularly as it relates to retirement costs. And so there's that gap that needs to be met. And the gap for the city, the entire city this, this coming year, at least from the general fund standpoint, is $2 million. And a variety of steps were taken by city administrator to close that gap, but then there was that remaining gap, which is why our department's being asked to find that 1%. Um, in order to help close that gap. And other general fund departments are required to find some cost savings as well. Well, uh, an example would be youth activities. Actual and, um, and hourly employees in 2016 was 48485 And we go down to proposed in 20, 
18 at 33,686, which is a huge decline. And then I go down and look at RAP participants from 480 to propose to 350. Does that mean we're cutting spaces? And Chair Longstreet and commissioners, so the, let me answer the second question first. So we are not cutting spaces in RAP. We're okay. just strategically looking how to provide the service with the correct staff resources. The biggest change in the hourly numbers for the youth activity section is as we rolled out our free summer fun program, I'm gonna say it was five years ago, it's, it's essentially was living on three school campuses. And those campuses were strategically placed around town, Franklin, Harding, we had one up at McKinley. As the school district has brought on their own programming in the summertime, or campuses have changed their priorities, we're struggling with how many campuses can we have to host those programs. Um, other programs have come online, like the West Side Boys and Girls Club runs a very active program on the west side of town. Um, Harding works with the Fun in the Sun program. So more youth providing groups to keep kids engaged in the summer have come online. So one of the strategies we're employing this year is taking our three sites, condensing it down to two. So we're gonna run two free summer fun sites, um, one at McKinley, or sorry, one at Monroe and one at Franklin. And that reduction in one site, we've increased participation, but it's allowed us to save a lot of those hourly hours from running a full site for another seven weeks all day for those kids. So the biggest reduction you see in hourly hours for the youth activity section is tied to the summer fun transition that we're currently going through for our free program. I'm glad to hear some other agencies have stepped up too. I mean, that's great to know there's more programming because that one just jumped out at me when I was going and I do go through all these numbers, the <laughs> long haul. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I noticed overall that there was that trend downward, but that one just jumped out. Okay, thank you, that answers. Other questions or comments? I think the next few years will be interesting, and um, I really appreciate how um, every year now the fees are looked at and we're not in this position where we suddenly have a full chambers here because we haven't raised fees in five years and now they're going up and everybody's having a heart attack about it. So I'm, you know, I think it says something that we're doing a better job of that, and I really appreciate all the work that you've done to bring us to this area. Um, I think I would like to convey in our comments to council that um, that we see these issues that are looming, and that we um, we are concerned about being able to keep our level of service up and um, maintain our facilities and our parks and affordable alternatives for the community, so. Can I add a comment to your comment? Yes, oh yes. And I think when most people think of infrastructure and they talk about what the city needs in terms of infrastructure, they think roads, streets, sidewalks, police and fire buildings, but our parks and our programming are critical infrastructure to the health of this community. That's my comment to the comment. Other comments you would like added? Is this will go forward to council with our, um, with our comments. Mark, I saw yesterday that um, you did a competitive comparison for the golf course. Is that done in regards to all of the programming as well for um, the consideration of raising the costs? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Armbruster, yes. Um, where possible, where, where there is a market that we can compare to, we do. Um, and most sort of sporting and camp events and things like that, there's a pretty dynamic market out there to be able to compare to. And so we're very conscious of that when we're setting our fees. Well, I would entertain a motion with our comments to go forward to council. Yeah, just a question okay. for clarification. Because we discussed the fees and charges schedule, are we gonna combine those with the general fund? I think we can. Okay, then with that, I would make the motion that we recommend the approval of the recommended fiscal year 2018-2019 budgets for the general fund and the fees and charges scheduled. Okay, and with our forwarding our comments, is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 
Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, anyone for golf? So, the golf fund. The overview, just to remind you, the golf fund is an enterprise fund, so therefore it receives no general fund support. And the mission for the golf club is it's dedicated to providing residents and visitors an exceptional and affordable golfing experience in a friendly, inclusive environment for socialising and enjoying nature. If, some, if I could remember that when I'm having a terrible round, I could do well. So the budget highlights here. Um, because the Golf Fund is an enterprise fund and it needs to pay its bills out of the revenue that it generates, um, one of the things we think about is, okay, well, how, how, how aggressive do we want to be in terms of the operation, in terms of the cost structure, and how, how do we want to look at our fees and, and, and what do we want to do? So we want to, A, well, one, provide great value for money, Two, we need to be aware that we need to build our reserves because for too many years now the Gulf Fund has been under council policy in terms of how much money it has to support itself. And three, we recognise that we need to continue to invest and catch up on investment that was delayed over the last few years into the Golf Club. How are we going to achieve this financial strategy? Well, we need to continue to provide excellent customer service and continuous improvements to the course conditions. That's actually documented by third-party secret shopping scores, which are very, very good since CourseCo have been operating the, the, the golf club since July 2016. We have a significant capital improvement budget possibly one of the largest ones in the local area for any publicly operated golf course. I mean, I can't speak for Montecito Country Club, of course, um, but for a publicly operated golf course, we have a significant capital budget that um, we're recommending. And we do need to also take into account that actually over time there is the need to have small increases into the fees because costs are always increasing. But of course, golf is an extremely competitive um, market, particularly in this town. A golfer in Santa Barbara is very, very lucky very spoilt for the choices that they have, and that's great for all of the golfers in Santa Barbara. So looking at some, some trends over time, this chart drops back to 2009. Um, two lines, the orange line is greens fee revenue, and the blue line are the number of rounds that have actually taken place. So you can see in 2009, there was just over 70,000 rounds generating $1.88 million. And it's been pretty, you know, flat around the 60,000 round mark since 2010. There's been some ups and downs. Um, and revenue has been on a slight uptick, and that will be because, of course, over that time period, there's been a number of price increases. And so what you'll notice towards the right-hand side of the chart is that we're actually projecting this year to finish the year with just under 60,000 rounds, and that's below budget. And it's obviously below where we were in FY16. But in FY17, in FY we obviously had actually a little bit of rain, which has not happened over the last few years. And so that's been fantastic for a number of reasons, obviously. But it's difficult to get people to come and play golf when it's bucketing down outside. Um, that said, in our budget assumptions, we've considered that we think FY18 and FY19 are unlikely, well, we don't know because we're not weathermen, unlikely to have the same amount of rain, etc. So we're hopeful that that's going to generate more rounds and then obviously more revenue. So our recommended revenues for the Gulf Fund, you can see that our amended budget this year is just over $3 million, and our recommended budget for next year is $2.8 million. So the budget's actually a reduction of a quarter of a million dollars. That sounds like a bad thing. Let me explain to you why it perhaps isn't so bad. Um, within the amended budget for 17 and the projection for this year are two one-off items that aren't related to the operation of the golf course. There's $180,000 of revenue that's come into the, to the program in FY17. That's a new loan that the Gulf Fund received from the General Fund because it needed it at the time. It needed that cash inflow. And so that's the way it's accounted for. It shows it as a revenue, so it's a loan. And the second part is there's a one-time transfer from the Fleet Fund within the um, Public Works Department of $149,000, representing money over the years that the Golf Fund has paid into the Fleet Fund to be able to then finance purchases of new mowers, vehicles, and the like. So because now we're under a different management and operation, we took a decision to transfer those monies into the Golf Fund, and now the purchases of all fleet vehicles and, and machinery is going to be done directly by the Golf Fund. 
And so in, in essence, this is an accounting mechanism to be able to move those monies into the Gulf Fund. So the key line to focus on, I would say, would be the Gulf operations. And so we're recommending that in FY18, the Gulf operations will generate 2.69 million, which is actually an increase of 2.6% against the amended budget for 2017. How does the golf course generate its revenue? Well, 62% comes from greens fees. That is the largest element. Carts make up the second largest element, just under half a million dollars. And then you see that merchandise is, is recommended at 234,000. Merchandise has a cost of sale, so it's only the 30% that we would receive as, as net profit. And then there are a number of other areas, and you can see the next significant item is that the rent received from the Mulligan's restaurant under the current contract is recommended and expected to be about $155,000 next year. We're recommending some fee changes um, to commence January 1st, 2018. Um, we don't anticipate that our fee changes of $1 on most of the, of the rounds is going to have an adverse impact on play. We're also recommending a new preferred players card, which was well received by the Golf Advisory Committee at their meeting yesterday. And I think I can objectively say that the Greens fees still offer exceptional and great value, even with the $1 increase. Expenditure, how is it made up? Well, maintenance is the largest cost. Within that, 40% of the pie uh, is the maintenance labor, water, materials, fertilizers, all of those types of things. Golf operations is the pro shop. And then the golf general administration would be credit card fees, the head pros, all of those types of things. And you'll also see in here what we talked about in the general fund um, discussion. The, the accounting here of the transfer to the general fund for the contribution of 145,000. Two other things I want to point out. Debt payments are going to be 128,000. At the end of FY18, one of the loans will be paid off in full. And so that obviously leaves the golf course in a better position. And transferring $264,000 to capital will, will enable the, the golf course to continue to make significant improvements and attract more golfers going forward. So here are the expenses on a um, numbers basis. And so you can see actually, again, that it's a redu significant reduction in expenses when you compare them to the current year. And the two main areas for that is the reduction in debt. You know, we just have less debt to pay back because we've been able to pay it back. And the reduction in the Gulf Fund contribution for the overhired staff who were transferred. And again, it's anticipated that it may not be the $145,000 that actually gets charged in the fiscal year. So some of the highlights there, we're reducing the city allocation of oversight costs from 0.7 FTE to 0.35 FTE. There's the contribution to the general fund, as we talked about. The um, reduced debt payments ongoing we are carving out enough money to be able to transfer to capital to continue the course improvements. We're recognizing that water costs are increasing. We're budgeting for that. And uh, like I say, the, the capital investments. What does that mean to the reserves? Well, at the start of this fiscal year, the Gulf Fund had just under $370,000 in the bank. You think about it in that way. Uh, the requirement from council is to have about 800000 from a reserve policy standpoint. Okay, so it's underwater negative equity when it comes to the reserve policy. All being well, we're hopeful that by the end of fiscal year 17, we'll be able to grow the reserves to about $450,000. And then the recommended budgets that I have before you at the moment suggest that we might be able to put another 90000 in at the end of 18 and then a further 63000 at the end of 19, meaning that and in two years' time, hopefully, the Gulf Fund will be sitting on $606,000 of reserves. Now, that picture could be improved, of course, based on the Gulf Fund contribution for those staff. Capital projects. It was one of the cost lines I shared with you in, in the pie. $264,000 is what's recommended for fiscal year 18. 
and it's spread across a number of different areas. It's recognizing that there's some capital projects we can do which actually have a tangible, immediate benefit to golfers enjoying the golf course. There are projects, so, you know, renovating restrooms and, and, and um, renovating calf parts has an immediate impact for golfers. There are projects involving irrigation which may not have an immediate impact but of course are vital to making sure that we use water effectively and efficiently and are perhaps longer burn projects and so we're allocating $85,000 to that project. We know that we need to renovate one of our tee boxes um, so again that will be something that golfers will be able to see in, in FY18 and then do more of them in 19. And then we're going to continue with the Players Improvement Fund which is where one dollar from every paid green fee cruise into a, a, a pot of money that a players improved subcommittee canvas golfers and say, hey, what do you what like to see? What can we do to improve the golf course? They bring those ideas forward. They go to the GAC. They get voted on. And then ultimately, if it's the right thing, the staff will implement it and, and make it happen. And we've had a number of very successful projects over the last couple of years where the Players Improvement Fund have, have made some real differences. And then finally, we're allocating $30,000. I mentioned earlier about that transfer from the fleet division. So we're allocating $30,000 in 18 and 19 to be able to go and buy a mower if we need one or, or, or whatever it would be like that. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, at their special meeting yesterday, the Golf Advisory Committee reviewed the budget, the revenues, the expenses, the fees, and they voted unanimously to recommend the proposed 18 and 19 operating budget, capital budget, and fees and charges. Yeah. So we'll leave it. Any questions for the golf fund? Yeah. Questions for the golf fund. Yes, Mr. Kvass. So I noticed on your capital, one of the line items was bunkers. Are you adding bunkers or are you taking them away? Because depending on how you answer, that's going to affect my... <laughs> I uh, vote taking them away. I'll can I plead the fifth? Yeah. <laughs> Chair, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Kavasa. So um, we're not proposing at this time to remove any bunkers. Um, and we're not proposing to add any bunkers at this time. So that would just be general bunker maintenance. Um, and so, you know, it's a much larger project than what we actually have allocated there over two years. But one of the um, key areas we'd like to be able to get to over time is to improve the drainage in bunkers to, to um, improve the, the play out of those bunkers. But that's a very large project. And this just allows us to sort of start that process. And then my more serious question is, <laughs> in regards to your greens fees, what are the current greens fees right now? Um, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Cavazza, so the, the, there are more greens fees than I can shake a stick at, depending on how old you are, when you want to play, what day of the week it sure. is. Um, I don't know if I have it in this presentation. Um, yesterday at the, at the GAC, um, Commissioner Armbruster mentioned it. I shared with them uh, an analysis that compared Santa Barbara Golf Club with um, the local competition, I suppose, Glen Annie, the Ventura courses, Rancho San Marcos, and Sandpiper. So I have it here, and I can, if you bear with me one second, sort of tell you what it was showing us. Santa Barbara Golf Club is the cheapest golf course for anyone, irrespective of what time of day or day of the week. But the difference between your price you would pay versus an alternative golf course might be large or might be small, because every golf course looks at it slightly differently. Some golf courses think a Friday is the weekend. We don't, for example. And so um, our strategy has always been to offer the best value and to, be, to find it to be affordable. And so even with a $1 increase, we still maintain our position in the marketplace as the cheapest when compared to any of the local public play golf courses, and in some cases, significantly so. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think it's, it's always been a great course. Uh, I think your greens fees have always been reasonable. With that upset and all the golfers out there, I think you could probably get them up a little higher. But uh, I think it's always been a, a really good value. So good job. Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Cavazos, in the fees and charges that's in your packet, there's actually information about that too. So if you want to look at it at your leisure when you have some more time and have further questions. Other questions about golf? It's, it, the transition seems to have been very smooth this year. Um, and I am basing that on the fact that we have not had people here complaining to us, and which I think they would. Um, and I'm happy to see that the course is kind of evened itself out, it seems like, and it's moving forward. So this is good news. 
it was doom and gloom for a few years there, and it's nice to see the ability to, to tackle these projects and move forward and get the reserves back up. So it's important. Other questions or comments? I guess I would just like our comments to reflect that we are pleased to, with the direction the course is going um, and with what is happening out there. So is there a motion to approve the golf budget and fees and charges? I will move that. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, we've had a lot of capital discussions with you, um, so I'm not going to belabor these projects. I'm also I'm keenly aware that Greg Chittick has been patiently waiting for us to get to the IPM item on our agenda, and since he is a member of our IPM advisory committee, um, I'm happy to go in each project at length. Um, I, I, I believe the commission feels like it's quite up to speed after doing our tour and hearing presentations. So if we could just go to the next slide, we'll walk through. Nine projects are currently proposed in our six-year plan. We had a number of projects, as you remember, um, but through the budget review and preparation process, we sit down with other general fund departments and the city administrator reviews the proposals and comes up with a recommended capital budget that's been presented to you and to council and to other commissions. So for 18 and 19, um, actually, this is just showing you 18. Your staff report also has 19. Mm -hmm. For the most part, the primary, pri primary recommendations are in 18. And as you can see, there's a significant recommendation for capital that really does address a number of the needs that we have in a number of our parks and recreation facilities, whether it's making them more comfortable for our users, whether it's expanding their use, and particularly for children, or enhancing safety, access, um, stepping off into the off-leash dog fenced area world, which we've yet to do yet. Uh, also looking at a couple of our key ball field parks and neighborhood parks like Ortega Park and Dwight Murphy. Looking at our facilities like the Louise Lowry Davis Center, how do we undertake, and this is money for final design, renovations interior and exterior that really enhance its function as a community center. And then looking ahead, knowing that um, we've been talking about doing a new splash playground and, and for a number of times the fact that the West Beach location might make a lot of sense really starting to tackle that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I think you have a good sense of all the things that we're working on. Uh, would would uh, look forward to the commission's recommendation to council in terms of moving these projects forward. Thank you. Okay, are there questions or comments? I think Commissioner Clark's comment about infrastructure needs to be re-emphasized in this um, portion of our comments to um, Council. That to provide the um, recreation areas for our community and the services that we want, we need to reinvest in capital all the time. Um, and, and bring, our, bring some of our facilities up to date. And I think West Beach, um, a quad, the Splash play, Playground is a great example of that. I mean, you look at other communities and what their parks look like and what they have in them that are up to more modern standards. We have great playgrounds. I'm not saying we, d we don't, but um, as far as amenities, we, we could do more and um, if there was more money. Um, <laughs> but I think that it, we need to, to take a step into these areas and really, um, for a beach community, we don't have that many um, aquatic facilities. So, um, and the Cabrillo Ball, uh, Cabrillo Ball Room air conditioning, I mean, these are just investments in buildings that we 
have spent some money maintaining. So uh, it's important. Mr. Cavazos. Yeah, and I would just like to add, you know, when, when we did the field trip, you know, I think the, we would all agree that, you know, these, these are great facilities. When you look at the line items, you know, they're, they're not that expensive per project you know, doable things. It, it sounds like staff has a great idea on how they want to accomplish what they want to accomplish. So I just like to emphasize that again, when you, when you look at them individually, they, it, to me, they're no brainers. So, and I think we all kind of sense that. Yeah. Ms. Clark. And then additionally, if, we're, if the city needs to, the city does need to increase its revenue. We do have to look at the tourist aspect and Almost all of these programs in the capital budget are going to increase the perception of Santa Barbara as a beautiful place and a tourist destination, some place that people want to come spend their money. Are there comments? I would say that the, um, the playground at Muni, not only does that serve an underserved community, but it gives a needed facelift to a historic site. And so there's those are important bonnet park improvements again we're back to an underserved community in parkland um the off leash dog if we're going to continue to build um housing in dense in the density we're seeing right now we better figure out how to serve the amenities to our new residents and they're going to have dogs and they're going to have children that need to play and all of these things so um Yes, there's not uh, not one on there that uh, I would say is not important. So with that, I think we've made some comments that staff will craft into a cohesive <laughs> idea. And um, I would entertain a motion to support this capital budget. I'll make the motion to okay. support the FY 1819 um, capital improvement budget to council. Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Great, um, great information. Thank you. I'm glad we had the budget meeting we had last week. I think that helped prepare us for uh, all of this information. There's a lot of numbers in here. And I would in, um, encourage us to have a mid-year look at some of the hourly stuff and the impacts that are coming forward. Thank you. And that brings us, thank you for waiting patiently, um, to, yes? Oh, we have a, uh, we're going to take a one, two minute break, okay? Okay, we are back to a full commission, so I will call the meeting back to order. And we will be looking at item number five, which is Integrated Pest Management Annual Report. Yeah, well, good afternoon, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners. Uh, thanks for having me here for our 14th, uh, believe it or not, 14th Integrated Pest Management uh, Annual Report. I and believe with, it. It's hard to believe, <laughs> yeah. And uh, with me today, I do have uh, Greg Chittick, who is our Integrated Pest Management uh, Citizens Advisory Chair, and also uh, Jeff McKee, our Facility Manager from the airport, and also who is the IPM Coordinator for the airport. So I'll get started and try to be quick for you. So just as a quick overview, Integrated Pest Management, what it really is, it's uh, also known as IPM. It's an effective and environmentally sensitive decision-making system of pest management. And the goal is to minimize health and environmental and risk and financial risks. Uh, the IPM strategy, uh, which promotes uh, use of non-hazardous and or reduced risk alternatives that are protective of human health and the environment, reduces and eliminates the use of pesticides and products that are pose known, likely, or probable human health or environmental risk. And then we also have what's known as the pesticide hazard and exposure reduction also known as FAIR model, which assigns green, yellow, or special circumstances, which are red zones and allows the use of carefully screened materials by zone, designation, and materials that are tracked by 
units, and a unit is either one pound for dry materials or one gallon for liquids. And the departments that are involved are our Parks and Recreation Department, the Airport Department, Community Development Department, the Fire Department, Public Works Department, and the Waterfront Department. So here we go, citywide highlights. Total pounds of pesticides increased by 22% from 2015. Total gallons of pesticides decreased from, by 1.7% from 2015. An alternative hours increased from 7,142 to 9,148. So what you have here is a uh, is a graph showing the uh, 2016 pesticide use summary, and you have gallons and pounds and changes in gallons from 2015 and changes in pounds from 2015. And what you see is a material use. So for green, you can go through and look through it, and it goes, it's uh, 1.41, and pounds was 541.65, which was a change of 51%. And in uh, pounds, it's a 30% change. And then you got the yellow materials, which are 179.33 uh, gallons used, and pounds was 598.45, which is a... Uh, a minus 3% reduction and a, uh, in gallons and a 4% change in pounds. And then red materials, uh, we had a 11.89 uh, in gallons and 2.48 in pounds. And the changes were 16% in gallons and 144% change in pounds. So uh, overall, it was uh, the changes in gallons was a minus one. 0.7% and changes in pounds was 22%. So uh, exemptions, we had uh, some exemptions in 2016 and what we had going on is there with the exemptions, we had some emergency exemptions and what an exemption is, it, uh, it allows under our IPM strategy and our fare zone system, uh, the ability to go through and ask to use materials that are, are not in our report. And in regards to the materials that we have in our report that we can use without asking an exemption. And we do that purposely so we can go through and ask the committee we want to use X material so we can reduce our amount of materials that we're using out there in the field. So we did have some emergency exemptions and two were at the airport. And uh, excuse me, one, one emergency exemption was at the airport and two were at the golf course. Uh, the one at the, uh, the airport was for termite use to uh, go through and do some work on some older facilities out there. And then at the golf course, we had some uh, uh, issues with our greens where we needed to ask for an exemption to use some materials to uh, control uh, funguses on our greens. So that was very important in order to protect that resource. So the Parks Division highlights the total units in increase from 11.5 in 2015 to 32.87 in 2016. And the units of green materials, they increased from 0 to 30.14. And that was a material called Sluggo. And that Sluggo is a uh, material that used, green material to use to control uh, slugs and snails. And we use that at our uh, Alice Keck Park and also at the uh, Mission Historical Rose Garden. And then units of yellow material decreased from 11.5 to 2.73. And uh, we used no red materials in parks, and we had no exemption requests this year. Uh, the golf division highlights the total units of pesticides increased from 18 in 2015 to 61 in 2016. And the units of green, mat green materials increased from 0.93 to 1.27. And yellow materials decreased from 1.1 to 0. But uh, unit uh, red materials increased from 16 to 59 once again because of uh, controlling uh, funguses on greens because of the high rainfall we received this past year. And the golf course continues to uh, brew microorganisms and compost tea for the greens, so that's a uh, item that's still taking into effect, even with the new management that's out there. So that's a good, real good thing, real positive. So what we got going on is uh, city, hi city highlights.
or uh, attract alternative methods. Uh, there's an increase of 28 percent from 7,141 hours in 2015 to 9,148 hours in 2016. And as you look at the trend, you can see, like in 2007, 2008, and 9. The uh, use of hours was much higher, and uh, we had at that time what was known as a green team, and they were allowed to, that's for the parks, we were able to go through and use a lot of hours on on doing alternative methods. Uh, we still go through in the parks and use lots of alternative methods such as uh, mulching, wood chips, hand weeding, and weed whipping, and overall that's throughout the uh, entire city, so that's just a good way of tracking our uh, alternatives. So in summary, uh, the parks uh, division still has aesthetic challenges in our park system, and and a lot of that stems is we have lots of weeds, as you can tell, and we're always attacking the weeds. And with the rainfall this past year, we're we have a huge uh, workload, and we're doing our best to to keep the under bay. And uh, but it's one of those things that's who is who's never heard of a yeah, gardener who's never weeded. So it's one of those things that we continue to do. Uh, gopher populations, we've, with the rainfall once again, gopher population has exploded and uh, we're still maintaining our fields at a very high level controlling gophers, but we, we do have to go through and uh, attack them and, and do a very professional job. And alternative practices, we're always looking for alternative practices in our park system and also within our city in order to go through and uh, control things without having to use pesticides. So uh, on April 10th, April 10th, the IPM Advisory uh, Committee approved the 2016 IPM Annual Report. And also now I'm here to ask that the Commission approve the Integrated Pest Management 2016 Annual Report and forward the report to City Council. And if you have any questions for me, I'm here to answer anything. Okay. Are there questions? Mr. Cavazos. I think I get to have a funny comment on every uh, agenda <laughs> item. I'm happy to share my uh, alternative methods at Gophers because I'm dealing with one right now. Uh, <laughs> but on the serious note, and I know, uh, Mr. Escobar, you can't predict the future, but the the increase in, in the red materials obviously stood, stood out. Um, but would you anticipate that as we go forward that we can keep that number down or as technology improves, maybe we can increase in the alternative numbers because obviously that's the one that we want to keep down as as much as we can. In re in regards to red materials, uh, it's a real difficult one because we're trying to go through and control funguses on on greens on golf greens, and if you're not aware of this, a golf green can cost anywhere from fifty thousand to seventy thousand dollars to go through and actually rebuild if it was to die. So you have to really protect your investment. And when it, the material is being applied, it's being applied in a real, very safe manner. So th that's a real positive thing in regards to that. Uh, in regards to red materials, it's once again, it's it could be for health and safety reasons as, as well. That's why you're applying those materials. Sure, so, so with the spike, you, we got mosquitoes and termites. So are, it, is the bigger uh, cause for the spike due to the, the fungus outbreak? That That's a, a part of it. And the other part was also at the airport in regards to mosquitoes. And it, we need to go through and keep mosquitoes at bay and in check because we have not only do we have West Nile virus that's at, at uh, the airport in the slough out there, at Galita, but uh, also now with Zika coming on board, you know, it's, it's nothing to... Uh, to take lightly, so we do have to protect our uh, our population here. Would you like to make a comment, either one? Of, yes. <laughs> Come on up, Jeff. I'm Chair Long Street Commissioners. I'm Jeff McKee, um, Facility Manager for the airport. I wanted to say a little bit about our red material. The airport used the majority of the red material um, last year. And as Santos said, it's mosquitoes, but it's also um, tenting for termites. So that's a, a larger number than you would think uh, for each building that's uh, treated. Um, we have a lot of uh, World War II era buildings at the airport, so we have a lot of termites. And, and that's going to be an ongoing need to take care of those termites 
each year. The other thing is gophers. We use fumatoxin on the airfield. Um, they are not only damage the airfield so that it's not smooth um, for aircraft that would leave the runway surface. Uh, we need to have a smooth, compact surface for those aircraft. Um, they also attract predators, birds, and mammals. So that can cause a bird strike or an animal strike for aircraft. So that's two reasons. Also, the, the um, airfield is surrounded by an eight to 10 foot fence, barbed wire. So it's a good place for fumatoxin. Um, you have to have control tower permission to get out there. So it's not likely that someone will be uh, exposed to that material. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chittick, would you like? No? No, I would just like to say thank you for um, all the years. It's, you've been here since the beginning, you and I both. So um, <laughs> it's nice to, to see you're still involved and thank you for that. Um, I, I think the city's doing a good job. I, I, I think overall we're, um, a, there's an awareness and it is especially important um, that we're not using so many the red materials where we have young people, children playing, things like that, um, pets. The golf course, it's adults, and they're not down on their hands and knees wallowing in it, um, we hope. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we won't talk about present company excluded, but you know, or the airfield where it is a safety issue. So um, I think. Thank you for doing it. I know this is something that the city, uh, it's evolved over the years and become a lot um, more concise. So thank you. Other questions or comments with this? Um, we need to approve this report. Have you, are you guys actively recruiting for the two vacant positions on the IPM advisory committee? Uh, yes, we are. Okay. Seems like they've been empty for a while that is correct so if anyone out there is listening there are two vacant positions on the IPM advisory committee <laughs> yes and it is time to apply currently yes. <laughs> okay um, is there a motion to uh, approve this report and accept it yes yeah, so moved okay is there a second okay we've got a motion and a second all uh, any discussion all in favor Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes units. Thank you all for what you do in this area. Um, mm -hmm. Very important. And with that, we are concluding our business, and uh, this meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you.